Hi, please take your seats. Uh, I'd like to call to order this uh, meeting of the County Board Thursday, July 24th at 6.31 p.m. Can I have a roll call, please? Harkey? Here. James? Here. Jay? Here. Kibler? Here. Langenheim? Maxwell? Here. McGuire? Here. Michaels? Here. Mitchell? Here. Petrie? Here. Quisenberry? Richards, Rosales, Schrader, Schwartz, Here. Alex, Here. Berkson, Here. Carter, Here. Cohort, Present. Esri, Here. Harper, Here. Kurtz. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. All right. Next up on the agenda. What? Work hard for what you want because it won't come to you without a fight. You have to be strong and courageous and know that you can do anything you put your mind to. If someone puts you down or criticizes you, just keep on believing in yourself and turn it into something positive. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, notice of the meeting, please. Notice is hereby given that a regular meeting of the County Board, Champaign County, Illinois, will convene on July 24th, 2014, at 6.30 p.m. in the Lyle Shields Meeting Room, Brookings Administrative Center, 1776 East Washington Street, Urbana, Illinois, in said county for the purposes of allowing and ordering payments of claims against the county, receiving and acting upon reports of committees and such other matters as may be brought before said meeting, which said meeting shall continue in session from day to day until the completion of said business. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve the notice, please. So moved by Lloyd. Second. Second. Second by Josh. Uh, any, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I'd like a motion to approve of the agenda and addenda. So moved by Stan, second, second by Aaron. Uh, any changes or additions? Are all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Uh, number six, you have date and time of the next regular meeting, standing committees, committee of the whole, and the county board meetings. Uh, also, legislative budget hearing meeting uh, Monday and Wednesday, August 25th, 27th of Monday, next month. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's it. I'm sorry, what? Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday. Wednesday. That's it. At six. Now it's uh, it's not six thirty on your agenda. It's six p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, six p.m. Thank you. Uh, public participation. We have two this evening. Uh, each have five minutes. Uh, Dorothy Vera Weiss, please. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you again for the opportunity to provide input on the Sheriff's Operations Master Planning Proposals. I'm Dr. Dorothy Vurowise at 2103 Mills Drive in Urbana. In my past work as a family physician and public health doctor, I was involved in treating illnesses and uh, injuries that had already occurred, and also in advising patients um, and designing programs that would prevent these injuries and illnesses. Both treatment and prevention are, gen are essential, and in health, as in criminal justice arena, preventive measures are generally more cost-effective and do more to improve the quality of life uh, for individuals, families, and communities. The focus of the Facilities Committee is, appropriately, on the buildings that meet the needs of county functions, such as the Sheriff's Department activities. When the Board is gathered as a whole, as this evening, the focus is different. You have the responsibility of balancing priorities between jails and preventive programs, as well as balancing that with all the other county functions, and also for being good stewards of our tax money. This is a significant responsibility, and I thank you for shouldering this burden. 
Section three of the ILPP report on historic and projected crime and justice trends included a word of caution about making projections for future jail, bed, and space needs. It notes that projections are usually based on past average daily inmate populations, past data about crimes, and future projections of countywide population, all of which are outside of the control of the county itself. But future jail population is affected even more by factors that the county can control, like changes in sighting and pretrial release procedures, changes in average length of stay in the jail, the use of electronic home detention, adequate mental health and substance abuse programs in the community, and effective re-entry programs that reduce recidivism. These programs keep people out of jail who are not a danger to others, and they provide for rehabilitation and reincorporation into the community as productive members of society. Since they're cost effective, there's still money for jail expenses that are truly needed. Some of these programs are already in progress, but their full effect isn't yet known. The proposed contract for Sheriff's Operations Master Plan authorizes $154,000 for the planning services, plus an additional five to 40,000 or so for developing plans for the option that's chosen. This is about three times the amount that the county administrator had said was available in the budget. This means less money is available for preventive programs or for pilot programs to test and prove procedures in the criminal justice system. A major emphasis in the ILPP report was putting more resources into changes in procedures and into preventive community-based programs. Spending these funds on the consultant's contract and what's been bantied about as a $20 million or so jail would mean that instead of first determining the functions that are needed and then developing the appropriate plans for the jail improvements, the jail would become primary and deprive other county programs of funds. I believe that you're probably going to approve this contract this evening though I think it would be better if it were first changed to require that at least one of the three options uh, that they present is a lower cost option that assumes a smaller jail population, smaller in custody mental health facility, more use of community-based services, and use of existing county facilities uh, for functions that don't need to be in the jails themselves. The board will still have opportunities to help shape the consultant's activities. The project work plan includes several steps where a progress presentation is to be made to the board or to the facilities committee. I sincerely hope that all of these presentations will be made to the full board or to the committee of the whole addressing justice and social service issues so that the focus can be on the larger goal of ensuring public safety rather than on the limited goal of the jail itself. This would provide opportunities to steer the consultant's continuing work towards the priorities that best meet the needs of the county. We need to have improvements in the jail facilities. I don't, don't dispute that. But I would much rather be able to say that I live in a safe county that values all its people that, than that I live in a county with a great jail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mark Enslin, Eslin. Yes, I wanted to speak to the uh, allocation request proposal for um, the work plan and fee proposal. Um, and um, on uh, section B um, of that proposal, um, calls for it, it specifies that there would be a jail population data analysis, um, which would include gathering and analyzing daily count and annual average data by inmate classification for housing impacts, particularly for mental and medical health detainees, um, and project classification group and booking counts as necessary. Um, and then at the end, um, it says that there would be uh, regular reports, progress reports. Um, that part really interests me. Um, was, uh, when I th um, I've been following this because I've been sensitized to various issues related to the jail, and um, the ILPP report, um, which precedes this, and in, in a way, this is um, 
I, I think it ought to be understood as trying to fulfill some aspects of the ILPP report rather than the other way around. Um, already in the cover letter of the ILPP report, it says, uh, the objective of this needs assessment was to explore the dynamics of justice system demand and to plan facilities. It identifies, now this is in bold, how improvements in policies and practices can fundamentally alter crime, demands on the justice system, facilities, and county finances. So when I see that, I, I'm thinking, um, um, since this report was done, where is the committee to implement this plan from the ILPP? Uh, that plan calls for a criminal justice executive committee. Did I miss something? Um, and I would, th this uh, to me goes to the question of to whom is the uh, current master plan proposal going to report? Who are they going to report to? I think it should be reporting to somebody that is going to be implementing the ILPP plan, which is in progress. It has, there are some things that are happening and some things that have yet to be done. On page 24 and 28 of the ILPP report, there's a very handy uh, sheet checklist of things that they're recommending. You might want to take a look at that again and see how far we've come. Um, and so I, I would wish that the progress reports be something that you actually take advantage of. Um, are you the clients? Am I the client as a citizen of the county? Um, I think we ought to be asking, as, as this uh, company that you're possibly going to be allocating money for um, formulates a plan, that this plan actually accord with the needs and desires uh, to reduce the number of people in the jail. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bobby Trist. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bobby Trist. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I live in Champaign and have lived in this county since 1977. And uh, I've addressed this board several times before. And as some of you may remember, uh, last year marked 50 years of involvement with mental health and uh, as a volunteer, uh, as a college student, and then um, I've also worked in mental health in Michigan, Illinois, and in um, Germany. So I want to talk about deinstitutionalization. And when I was volunteering at El Elgin State Hospital in 1963, uh, well, actually, I was a, a substitute orderly in the Brethren Volunteer Service Program. And we, in addition to working on the wards, we got exposure to different things that were going on in mental health at the time. Um, we went to a court where the people were, um, what's the word, uh, put into the f judged, adjudicated uh, mentally ill, and also um, to various other uh, aspects. And the plan was to close the big, huge um, warehousing facilities where people would live for decades, often dying there. There was no good plan for getting out um, for the patient to initiate this. And there was little rehabilitation. Um, they were large warehouses and they were inadequate. Uh, the plan was that everyone would be put on psychotropic drugs, which were new at that time, and that there would be mental health facilities in the communities. These, these were also far away from cities or were population centers where the people lived, and that there would be housing for them in the local community. 
Well, what happened was the institutions were closed in the 60s and 70s. And medication is adequate to control most um, diagnoses, but there are problems with getting it and sometimes problems with people taking it. And if somebody's mentally ill, when they're not on medication, they often don't see the need for medication. When they are on it, they see the need. And there are, there are problems with um, getting funding for the medication. And also the laws have changed so that uh, you can't compel somebody to take medication like you could 50 years ago. Uh, there are mental health centers in most counties. The quality is uneven. The funding is often inadequate. It's slashed during economic downturns and then tends not to be restored. And chronic treatment, which is the kind of people that ended up in uh, mental hospitals, not somebody who has an acute suicidal episode and then is pretty much ready to go home. Uh, it's long-term, it's expensive, and it's not sexy and dramatic like acute, acute treatment is. You know, you put somebody in and they're in there two or three weeks and they're all better and they're functioning again. And with housing, uh, there are many problems with housing. First of all, there's um, group homes and supervised apartments are few and far between. Many mentally ill decline, do not have families to live with or families are not able to handle a uh, mentally ill person because sometimes they're hard to live with. Some have no family. Uh, Many are unable to live totally independently, and many decline to live with family for whatever reasons. Uh, in Champaign County recently, about um, a year and a half ago, perhaps, at the county board meeting, sorry, the um, mental health board meeting, the police officers uh, noted that they had three options to release when there's a complaint. Release a person back to the street, take them to the emergency room, but many are also blocked because of past behavior or take them to jail. Uh, there has been, um, there have been some developments because we now have respite. Ms. Twist, that's five minutes. Thank you. All right. Um, we have, we have your, like two we sentences. We have your statement here in writing. We appreciate okay, it. I have like two sentences. Can Thank I finish? You. Two sentences. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, but the respite is available only through the ER, and we really need a facility where the police can take somebody directly rather than having to be filtered through the emergency room. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to participate this evening? All right, we're closing public participation. Thank you. Uh, I'd like a motion, wait a minute, excuse me, communications. Uh, is there any communications from the board? Uh, just uh, note that Mr. Quisenberry is asked to be excused for this evening's meeting. Thank you. Uh, any, any communications? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like a motion to approve the minutes of May 27th, 14 study session, June 19, 14 regular meeting. Uh, John Jay, John first. I have uh, Stan as a second. Uh, any changes or comments on the minutes? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we now have a presentation of the 2013 audit. Uh, Ms. Wheeler and Mr. Farney, please take the stand. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, first, I'd uh, like to introduce Hope Wheeler. Hope is the uh, principal with Clifton Larson Allen that handles our audit. And uh, she has a short presentation that you all have a hard copy of. We'll also have it up here on the board. And uh, then if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. So I'm gonna give it to Hope for right now. Thanks for having me this evening. As he said, my name's Hope Wheeler and I'm a principal with Clifton Larson Allen. Um, I'm going to go through this presentation, which refers you to uh, three or four different reports that we issued in conclusion of our audit of the November 30, 2013 fiscal year. 
the the first report is is called a governance letter, and in I think electronically and in the handout you got there's a copy of this letter. But this letter is um, specific communications we're required to have with you as a governing board, and I'm just going to highlight some of the <clears throat> subtopics of this letter. First, we want to point out to you if there were any significant accounting policies adopted during the year. Here we reference there was a new GASB or governmental accounting standard adopted this year called GASB 63. It did not have a significant impact on your financial <laughs> statements. Um, it was really some terminology changes from net assets to net position and deferred revenues to unearned revenues. So no, no major changes with that GASB. In the future, um, I'll talk about a little bit later, there is an upcoming governmental standard that, that does make some significant changes. Second item is significant accounting estimates. There are estimates that occur in the accounting process when you estimate if you need to allow for doubtful accounts or um, incurred but not reported claims and things like that. But overall, uh, you didn't have any material significant estimates in your financial statements. Third bullet point there is corrected and uncorrected misstatements. There were no material audit adjustments as, as part of our audit process this year, which is um, a very good thing. It's rare that we don't have significant audit adjustments with a lot of our clients. We did have two what I would call minor adjustments. One was a reclassification of revenue that was just posted in the wrong account. And the other was just a, a posting of an asset and offsetting liability didn't have any effect on the uh, profit and loss side. Then there was one unrecorded statement. It was small enough. Um, it didn't have to be posted to your books, and that was related to something that was capitalized last year in construction and process that should have been expensed. Um, last two bullets are just to point out to you as the governing body that we did not have disagreements with management on financial accounting and reporting matters, and we did not experience difficulties in performing our audit process. Next, I'm going to just point out to you, within the, the CAFR, the, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report that you received electronically, near the back of that report, I referenced pages in here. It'd be difficult to flip to those electronically, but if you want to go back and find them, pages 152 to 155, that's where we show our report findings. Um, we didn't have any significant financial statement findings. We did have four federal findings. So when we audited your federal funds, um, I'll go over later the programs we tested, but these are the four findings we had in that process. These four findings relate to the Access Initiative grant. Um, the first three are, are repeats from last year, if you saw last year's report. Um, the first item is just that interest expense is not allowable grant cost, and it was charged to the grant. It was totaled $49. Um, the second finding was <clears throat> over cash management, the uh, the federal rules say that you have to control how much federal cash you receive. You should only be receiving it as you're going to spend it. And there were times when there was excess federal cash on hand. The third finding relates to reporting. Um, two of the four reports that we tested were not filed on time, and then three of the four reports had an incorrect correct number for program income reported. Then the fourth finding relates to subrecipient monitoring. So some of the federal funding that you received, you passed on to others, and then you're required to do monitoring of that. And we found that they were also be given a couple of cases where the subrecipients had excess cash on hand, and they should only be given what they're needed or request back the funds that they have more than they need. <coughs> We issued a separate letter called a management letter, and these are just some additional findings or recommendations, not at the report level, that we wanted to bring to your attention. The first item in this letter, and that's a separate letter in your packet, but is some information about IT, and I think this is a repeat finding, and I know some of these areas are being worked on, but financial system user access controls are not implemented in the system. so. It, there's not adequate or sufficient limited access to different components of the accounting system. Financial software has limited support internally. Um, the AS400 operating system oper 
auditing functions are not enabled on the system supporting the financial application, so the tracking of changes uh, to the system isn't occurring, and then lack of documented disaster recovery plan. And I know that's the one I believe that you're close to having that, that one taken care of. The second item there or finding relates to the collector bank reconciliation. We're recommending adding a control to the bank reconciliation process of having that reviewed by a second person, actually the internal auditor's office, and I believe that has already started happening. Third item is court services is handled separately, and we found when looking at their bank statements that they don't receive their canceled checks back, and that's just a, a very significant, important internal control is to get the canceled checks or copies of the checks, check images back with your bank statement so when someone's doing the reconciliation or reviewing it, they can look at those checks and make sure um, nothing has been changed on the checks and that the signers are proper. The last comment there is related to negative cash balances. Um, a lot of times with, with governmental entities, at the end of a period, you have a pooled bank account, there'll be certain funds that have negative balances and other funds that are positive. So that's really creating an inner fund loan between those funds and the pooled account. And we recommend that just making sure that all of those, any negatives like that are, are approved in advance as inner fund loans. The next section is some financial statement highlights. So this is referencing different pages in the, in the CAFR report that you received electronically. Like I said, the page numbers can be for your reference later to go back and, and track down. But on page 21, there is the crux of the whole audit is our audit opinion. And this was a clean or unmodified opinion. We had no modifications of significance. Um, everything was in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. I, I go through some different sections of the report because it, it is a lengthy report just to explain them. The management and discussion and analysis, analysis section is after our audit opinion. That's a good section to read through. It really summarizes the whole CAFR and that's um, written by John and his office. There, on page 35 are there the government-wide statements. There are two different sets of financial statements within this. The government-wide statements are on the full accrual basis, so that's where all your assets are capitalized and depreciated, and your debt is recorded as, as a liability there. Um, your change, overall entity-wide change in net position for the year or revenues over expenses was approximately $5 million up from approximately $2 million from last year. So your total net position or your assets less your liabilities, net position is around $90 million. Then on page 37, you have fund financial statements. There you, we break it down so it's not so summarized and it's on a modified accrual basis of accounting. So the, the capital expenditures are reported as expenses, not capitalized, and then loans as they're paid down, they're shown as expenses, not as a liability. The major funds this year, we have to go through a calculation and determine which funds are considered major. Then we have to audit those separately. General fund is always major. This year also the mental health fund was major, developmental disability fund, IMRF fund, and RPC fund. And then enterprise or business type funds, the nursing home um, was a major fund also. So those are reported in separate columns in those fund financial statements. So you can see each of those balance sheet and profit loss statements. <clears throat> Next section is the footnotes, which are just different required disclosures. Um, just pointing out some different items there. If you want more detail of your capital assets or your long-term debt, there's page numbers referenced, referenced for you. There are a few five funds with deficit fund balances, and you can, those are listed there on page 70. <laughs> page 79 is what's called required supplementary information. I wanted to point that out to you because there um, is, is a section where for any of your pensions, like for instance, your IMRF pension, there's columns in that schedule that show what your unfunded liability is at this point in time, an estimate of that. Right now, that is not a recorded liability in your statements. <clears throat> it's just a disclosure. But in a couple of years, when this new accounting standard, number 68, has to be implemented, 
that liability will, will be recorded on the face of your financial statements. As of right now, that's approximately $16 million if you add up all the different pension funds. So that's just something everyone's watching for to see what that liability will be that's being added to their statements. Wanted to point out there too, in this section, we have to show the budget to actual for each of the major funds and just to comment on the general fund, those ex general fund expenses were under budget by approximately $780,000 for the fiscal year. That's on page 80. Beyond that, there's additional supplementary information where you can see all of the other funds of the county, the non-major funds. You can see each of those individually and how they're summarized together. Jumping to page 145, that's where the federal awards section starts. As I mentioned, we have to do what's called a single audit and test your federal expenditures. We go through a process um, that's required to determine which programs to test. This year, we tested Head Start, Community Services Block Grant, Workforce Initiative, which is a new one for us to test, and then Access Initiative. The we only had the four findings related to access initiative. We didn't have any findings on the other programs. Here's just some graphical information might be nice to look at. This is all governmental funds revenue. So this, this excludes nursing home because that's an enterprise fund. But for the rest of the funds that are governmental funds, this shows your property taxes, how they compared this fiscal year to last year intergovernmental revenues, charges for services, public safety sales tax, I see a typo there, and <laughs> licenses, permits, and fines, and other. You can see each of them are fairly, really comparable to the prior year with intergovernmental being increased probably the most from the prior year. Overall, 84 million in, in revenues there. The next slide is expenditures for all governmental funds, once again, excluding the nursing home. Here you can see once again each year comparing 2013 fiscal year to 2012. They are fairly comparable. General government is down slightly from last year. Those expenditures, justice and public safety up slightly. Um, the other categories are all really fairly comparable to the prior year. Then the last slide here is just showing in a picture form, the fund balances for each of those major funds I talked about, how you can compare for the past three years how the fund balance has changed. So you can see there for the general fund, um, there was a, a nice increase in the fund balance in this fiscal year, up to approximately $6 million. And then the other funds have stayed pretty consistent um, over the years. Regional Planning Commission has grown over the past couple of years, and that's one that stays pretty low just because of the nature of grant money coming in and, and going out. <coughs> that is all I had. Just wanted to uh, quickly try to run through and summarize this report if anyone has a specific question for me. Uh, are there any questions from the board? Chris. Just one. Um, looking forward to next year's audit, having gone through the process this year, uh, you're aware of the 13-month fiscal year that we're operating under in 2014. Do you envision any issues or challenges associated with that at the audit level? Um, nothing that we can't prepare for, but it does make for some <coughs> issues. I just dealt with another governmental that changed fiscal year ends, and it was it was a bigger change than that. It makes a lot, we do a lot of comparing to the prior year, so it makes that a little difficult, but we'll we'll try to do our best to estimate and extrapolate things, things to make up for that difference. Um, it creates more issues, honestly, like with the state report that's due, because the state can't handle submitting two reports with what could look like the same fiscal year end, because you could end up with two FY14s or 15s. So we had to go through a special process with that with this other client that, and it's been kind of a hassle. We had to do an 18 month report rather than a short period one. If um, I could follow up, my hope would be that by at least aligning with uh, the calendar quarters, it might make some of the federal analysis a little easier in, in future audits. Yeah, I, I do think lining up with a calendar fiscal year end will make things simpler as far as us looking at payroll even and grant reporting. And so I agree there. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, is the report up on the county website or will it be up on the county website? Yes, it already is. You thank received that email on Monday with the live link. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to place this on file. So moved. So moved by Stan, second by Diane. Uh, any other questions or discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. All right. Um, let's move to uh, county facilities. Stan. Uh, just a summary of just a summary of action taken. Was there anything to add to your uh, committee report? No, sir. Okay. Uh, we do have a an adoption. Go right ahead, please. You want to do it? Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. Go ahead, and then I'll get a second. Okay. We need adoption of resolution number eight nine one seven, authorizing the award of contract <coughs> to Gorski Restack Architects Incorporated for the Sheriff's Operations Master Planning for the County of Champaign, RFQ twenty fourteen dash zero zero five. Stan moves. Jeff second. Uh, discussion, please. No dis. Chris. Just a couple of comments. Um, it seems like we've been talking about the jail issue forever, but I wanted to make the point. I've been on the board for almost four years, and for the, about the first year and a half I was on the board, this didn't even come up as an issue. And what finally drove this issue to the forefront of the county board's attention was the facilities issues that we're having, specifically with the downtown jail. Uh, I think the board took a responsible course of action at that point, uh, eventually, by looking into the, uh, the overall justice system as a whole in the form of the ILPP report and the uh, formation of the Community Justice Task Force. Uh, I think that, that the, it's clear from the ILPP report that Dr. Kalmanoff identified both steps that need to be taken to reduce the need for incarceration and steps that need to be taken to provide safe and effective facilities for the people who are incarcerated and for the, the staff that works in those facilities. Uh, on the first, uh, on the first, in the first area, um, I'm pleased. I believe that we're seeing signs of improvement. I mean, the sheriff has worked with uh, local law enforcement agencies to encourage increase in the use of citations in lieu of arrest, and that seems to be uh, having an impact uh, to some extent on the jail population. Uh, local police agencies are uh, putting more investment into uh, crisis intervention training for uh, some of their officers, and the idea there is to help uh, law enforcement officers uh, deal with mentally ill uh, people in a way that's uh, less likely to escalate into an arrest situation. Um, the sheriff has figured out how, uh, due to relatively low population, to house uh, women in the satellite jail. Uh, instead of the downtown jail. They're not in optimal conditions, but they're in better conditions that they were in in the satellite jail, and that addresses a, a serious equity issue which the Kalmanoff report uh, brought out. Um, we have the drug court. We are funding a reentry program, which it's a little too early to tell whether it's bearing fruit or not, but my assumption is that we'll see positive results from that. Uh, we have not a community, or not a justice executive committee exactly in Kalmanoff's formulation, but the sheriff and the state's attorney, the public defender, and the judiciary are working closely together to try to manage the jail population. And I think the fact that the jail population is the lowest it's been in decades is, is testament to the fact that that's working. Uh, have we done everything that we possibly can to reduce jail population in Champaign County? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, there were specific recommendations in the Kalmanoff report, which we, uh, you know, encouraged uh, and funded, but. Uh, which other stakeholders were, were not interested in implementing or were not able to implement. Um, you know, Mr. Ansler made, made excellent points about ways in which we can, we can go farther. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Ms. Trist's comment about the need for a, uh, a respite center, a temporary mental health facility where people who have contact with the criminal justice system and don't need to go to jail can be taken. I mean, that's a lack in this community that every cop on the street will agree with and something that I definitely hope uh, progress is made on. Uh, the sheriff has implemented a new inmate classification system directly as a result of recommendations in the Kalmanoff report, uh, which uh, has enabled uh, some prisoners to be held in the downtown jail under more relaxed conditions, uh, as more of a more of a uh, reduced security facility. 
So, you know, we have, we, we, they are taking steps that have come out of the, the CJTF recommendations and the Kalmanoff report. Um, I think we need to look, though, and realize that the specific facilities issues that are really being pressed by the sheriff and that were, address, that were really being pressed in the ILPP report, things like a lack of space uh, for mentally or physically ill inmates, uh, lack of a functional intake area because intake cells have had to be repurposed for housing, housing uh, inmates with medical issues, uh, lack of facilities for safely housing inmates who do need to be housed separately. You know, I, I would say that essentially the only reason that downtown, I don't think the sheriff would disagree with me this, that the primary reason that the downtown jail is still open is because it has a small number of cells in which individuals can be housed alone and we don't have enough of those cells at the satellite jail. That's clearly an issue for people who are involved in cases where their co-defendants are in the jail or people who are viewed as a threat to other inmates or vice versa. Um, and the lack of facilities for, for suitably housing women. So if what we had was an overcrowding problem, and I think you remember in the early days of these discussions, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the comments focused on, you know, we've got, we've got a jail, well, we don't have a jail overcrowding problem. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got downtown essentially an empty jail. So overall, we've got a half empty jail. But not one of these issues that I brought up, which are the issues that the sheriff's been the most concerned about, would be addressed even with a precipitous drop in the jail population. So, you know, I would love to see us get another 25, have another 25% fewer people in jail in Champaign County, but it's not going to give us facilities for women. It's not going to give us facilities for, for single housing people. It's not going to give us a better intake area. It's not going to give us an infirmary or, or safe space for mental, mentally ill inmates. So we've got also a facilities issue, which is we've got two jails. We've got two jail staffs. I think there's money. Clearly, we talk about, you know, we wouldn't want to spend money on construction because that takes money away from from. Uh, programming. Well, one other thing that takes money away from programming is inefficiencies in the way that the system operates. And having two jails, I think, is likely to turn out to be one of those one of those areas. So, I guess I would argue that in the same way that we were right to have ILPP and the Community Justice Task Force look at the overall criminal justice system issues, and we need to continue to do that going forward. I think it's also right to enlist expert assistance in determining what the cost of our existing practices are and what the costs are of the potential alternatives. I think that for me to oppose this proposal would be to essentially say that I don't want to know. I think that to be able to make any rational decision on how to address the facilities problems in the long term, we need to be operating on the basis of effective information. So I'm going to support this, not because I don't think there's further room for improvement in the justice system, but because there's obvious need for improvement in the facilities situation, and I think we need to move forward. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I just want to reiterate uh, my support as well. Uh, I think that was very well stated uh, point by point, and I hope the uh, public understands that uh, we as a county board care about both issues, uh, issues for housing our inmates and uh, safety uh, of our uh, corrections officers, safety of our inmates, as well as the proper facilities to house them in, but also we're working diligently on the social issues to help uh, prevent recidivism. And, uh, and as you can see, we've, we've dealt with a lot of those issues now, and women's issues, and the sheriff, I want to congratulate him on taking initiative uh, to help in, in those, uh, those issues that ILPP brought to, brought to bear. So uh, is there any other discussion? Patsy. Uh, Lloyd. I, I agree, we've been talking about this for centuries, it looked like, and I was on the board when we built the last new jail, and I remember when we built the one downtown. The taxpayers were nice. They always supported us when we asked them to, and I know vividly, I remember it when they told us when we built the last one. We've been had study on every project we have. And I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen a study yet live up to as me. Now, we built that jail. The taxpayer said, this is the last jail we're going to support. And I know you all can't. The member was here then. I know you remember that. No more funding for jailhouses. 
And I can't understand why we keep on pushing this. When, when I was coming up, your male patient went to Kankakee. They had a facility up there just for male patients. Then they moved from Kankakee down to Cub. It had a whole flow for male patients. So how is this trying to confuse people that you got to entwine sick people with people being locked up in jail. I can't understand that. It's two ends that should be separated. And I don't know how you're going to mix them together when that don't make any sense. The male patient should be going to the hospital that going to take care of the male patient's need. The guy that breaks the law should go to jail. Now, we've been trying to figure out how to combat this problem, but we never got to the truth. We spend $36,000 to hire the inmate, $6,000 in eight, $6,019 to send a guy to school. Your math is not right, gentlemen. That, that, that math just don't match. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna stay with the taxpayers because they promised that. And they told us, no more jail. You come up with some kind of program to keep these people out of jail. Now, we never did one thing, not any program, that would combat these young men going to jail. All we do is to change the laws to get them in there easy. A guy come up with a little nickel bag of, of what you call this weed, he go to jail for 20 years or 15 years. So you see right there is something wrong with the system. And the guy that, what you call this intent, I don't know all of these famous, but the, the guy different than intent to sell or uh, intent to use is a whole different program. The guy should that have it just to smoke should be going to jail forever for just smoking weed. So we got our priorities mixed up. And I'm not going to support this. Thank you. Uh, any other? Patsy? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> um, I thank Mr. Alex because he did present some uh, things that have been accomplished in a very logical and organized manner. So to save time, I'm not going to repeat those. I want to focus on a couple of other aspects um, that do concern me. Um, and some of this has been brought to my attention by some of my constituents. So uh, some of this I'm conveying from information I've received from them. Uh, the first aspect he has to do with the way this contract is laid out in that um, the total amount of the contract is just under $200,000. And even though they come back to uh, negotiate a five to forty thousand dollars section of the contract. The way it's written, uh, it appears that that will just be a uh, moot point when they come back for um, renegotiation. So that's just under two hundred thousand dollars. We spent one hundred and fifty thousand with IOPP, and the sheriff spent another twenty five thousand dollars with ILPP, so that's again a little under $200,000. So we're almost up to $400,000 that we've spent so far on this issue. Now, ILPP is mentioned in the outline of the work, especially in uh, A through C of the contract, but there has been no mention of the very hard work that the Community Justice Task Force did and he has done and the report that they put out. Um, I think that's a very sad signal that we as the county board have sent to citizens of the community who spent a year working very hard on this report and then we are not um, 
enveloping it into these next steps. And then we as a county board wonder why we don't have citizens coming forward and applying for vacancies on boards or working with us at a county board when we have very overtly shown that we're not integrating that. Nobody from the Community Justice Task Force was chosen to be part of the team that wrote the RFQ or that set up the scope for this contract. And again, that's indicating that we're not paying or honoring the work that they have done. Uh, and that has been noted by people in the community, and I think the county board needs to start taking those things uh, to heart. Um, I will support this uh, only because we're between a rock and a hard spot, and we're in that position because of previous boards who either by benign neglect or purposeful neglect have really created the situation that we're presently in. And we know that actually because of the work that the Planners Network students did when they did the analysis of the amount of money of prevention and care that had been spent on the satellite jail as compared to what was spent on the downtown jail. I'm not arguing that the downtown jail is a perfect building. It is in the sense that structurally it's very so sound and can be gutted on the inside and a lot of rearranging of space can be done. But the point is that we are now in this present situation because of the previous boards, whatever. And so we're here. That's a lesson for all of us to take as we proceed forward and spend even more money on these next steps. And my last comment is that I'm not sure that the citizens of this community can handle more tax dollars being taken out of their pocketbooks. And to do move forward, um, somebody mentioned this is a $20 million project. Some people have said it's a $22 million project. Nobody knows how much it is. It's a large, expensive project and we have unit four who will be coming before the voters very soon for even a larger amount of money on a referendum and I think we need to keep all of that in mind as we talk about facility and we talk about community justice task force recommendations on social justice programs for our community. Thank you. Stan. Well, I would just like to say, serving on that committee that was reviewing all these things, that the ILLP report encompassed the task force report, which was all included. So yes, they were given due uh, oversight and looking at, and some of their verbiage was taken in on that report, and we looked at that. Uh, I keep hearing this 20 million, 22 million. I've heard it from day one. No one's ever set a fee or a schedule. I, I don't know where that rumor started. It started, it's out there. Uh, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Uh, in that ILLP report, it was stated that uh, due to the conditions of the downtown jail, we could be facing a lawsuit. Well, if we face a lawsuit, in my mind, we could end up spending more money than if we move forward to see what our options are. And I think the team that's been chosen, out of all those that were interviewed, uh, I think all of them will do us a good job and we'll get the report we need. It may not be what some of us want to hear, but it's going to be a good report. Uh, with that, I, I, you know, all I can say is we need to do something. We keep putting stuff on the burner, and, and you know, I hear all this about the public being involved in the RFQ process. It is what it is because of the way it's set up. I run a business. I serve people, but I don't have them set at the table to tell me how to run that business. I take their input, and then I do what I need to do. Uh, we can't sit everybody at that table and argue for months and months about something small. And this time I can honestly say when we went through that contract and we set it in negotiations, we did our darndest to make sure that everything was in line. Is something going to slip through? I'm sure it will. But we looked at the whole picture and I think we are going to get one heck of a report. I think that it's been a process and I think the time is due and we need to see where our buildings are. Then we'll see what the costs are. It might be 10 million, it might be 12 million, but I've never heard 20 million. Uh, any other further discussion on this issue? All right, let's move forward. I have one roll call. Second roll call. 
All right, we're going to take a roll call vote on this issue right now, please. Roll call vote. Harkey? Yes. James? Yes. Jay? Yes. Kibler? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Richards? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Alex? Yes. Bergson? Yes. Carter? No. Cohort? No. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Kurtz? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, highway. Lorraine? Could you turn on, turn on your microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. Highway has several things. We have uh, nine items from RPC, which I'm going to ask uh, Rita if she step up and uh, explain it to the committee. Good evening. Um, you have on your packet several resolutions regarding uh, the provision of rural transportation services in Champaign County. Um, I was here past February and explained the situation that our current provider, Chris, was uh, unable to continue to provide service. And based on that, we did an analysis uh, of the providers available around Champaign County to decide which was the most uh, likely provider uh, for Champaign County based on the conditions that we have in the county. After doing interviews, after doing analysis, uh, we proposed or recommended to be CUMTD, uh, the provider for rural transportation services in Champaign County. I explained the reasons, and at the time you gave me uh, the go-ahead to start working on and developing an intergovernmental agreement with uh, CUMTD, and that's what you have in front of you. Along with that, uh, because CUMTD will be able to provide the service beginning on October 1st, then you have in front of you two different intergovernmental agreements. One uh, was Chris between July 1st and September 30th, and the other one is from October 1st until June 30th of 2015. Along with that, we also have uh, vehicle lease agreements that we have had in the past, and in this, at this time is with the two different providers that we'll have for the uh, fiscal year 2015. And also there are uh, two documents that uh, IDOT requested us to put in place. That's the procurement policy and the Title VI policy for provision of rural transportation services in Champaign County. And um, the other element that we have, the other document that we have uh, on the packet is the grant application to get the funding to be able to provide rural transportation services in Champaign County for fiscal year 2015. If you have any questions. Uh, any questions? Uh, let's start with Diane. <clears throat> Just a quick question here. I mean, I still see them running all over town, and that's wonderful. This will completely remove the Vermilion County um, cooperation, or is there still a little bit of that hanging out from some grant time? No, or is the it just beginning October now? 1st, we will be okay. completely separated from Vermilion County. And this will all just be Champaign County only then? We yes. won't be going out to the outlying areas like we were before? From yes, okay. will be the same service. Okay. Uh, before I, Patsy, I, I just want to remind the board that this has been a extremely successful program. Uh, Chris has been uh, growing and growing over the past few years. We now have more than 1,100, if I'm correct. Is that right, mm -hmm. Rita? 1,100 registered uh, riders. riders that use our program monthly. And if we don't make this change, we'll lose, they'll lose all that transportation coming out of the, out of the county. Uh, and so I want you to understand that what we're doing is moving all of the program from Chris to the MTD 
Uh, they've already housed our vehicles. They're already maintaining our vehicles. Uh, they have the money and the dollars to help us make the match that we need. Uh, and um, I just want to make sure that you understand how important this program is to our community and to those who don't have the facilities to get around the county. This has been a, an extremely successful program, and I want to support it 100 percent behind Rita. Uh, Patsy, do you still have more questions? And then I'll go to uh, John and then Jim. Hi, Rita. Uh, you have your packet there yes. so I can make references. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, if you look at page 20. Yes. On Roman numeral 5, where it says new service hours are 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm curious, is that seven days a week or just Monday through Friday? Monday through Friday. Okay, maybe that needs to be added. It's on the grant application. Okay. The details. All right. And then on page 21, uh, uh, right at the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, number one, it says the MTD's um, lease term will be October 2014 to June 2014. Patsy, we discussed this in caucus. Why? I don't understand. We, we told you it was a typo mm -hmm. and that we, it's in the resolution corrected. I don't understand why we need to go back over it again. The resolution is correct. The, mm -hmm. the summary was incorrect as a typo. So I would appreciate if you would just go directly to read on questions of policy and if there's a problem there, but the typos have been corrected in the resolutions. Okay. May I ask my last question then? The rest of the people didn't hear the conversation at caucus. Uh, on page 91, uh, there, the estimate here is that there will be more money coming in than is budgeted for expenses. Uh, is there a plan for that differential and how that money is to be used? We have a total allocation of $741,000 approximately. We are expect, expecting uh, to spend from that amount $662,000. Right. Then uh, will be a remaining amount that we'll not be using. But maybe roll over to the next year? We cannot roll over. You cannot roll over. Roll over. Okay. And then uh, at the very end of that paragraph, it says its operators can obtain, uh, will uh, depend on their ability to secure local match funding. Mm -hmm. What is the local match funding uh, or what is that source? The local match funding is uh, the revenue through fares collected that right now is about $40,000. Uh, also, Chris okay. uh, has a contract with the nursing home, Champaign County Nursing Home. And there are other several contracts that they will be transferring to CUMTD to be able to collect that local match. There is no guarantee that we'll have all the local match that is needed. And that's why in the intergovernmental agreement, we put a clause that says, if we are not able to collect all the local match that is needed, then probably will be a reduction of service or we'll discuss with the Rural Transit Advisory Group the best way of moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Jim. Any other questions concerning Jim this McGuire. issue? I'm oh, sorry, Jim. You were next. John, you you have. Yeah. No, go ahead. And then well, Jim. I, I, be easy. I we we did talk about this at great length in caucus. Argued actually with great length in caucus. Uh, some of us have a concern that uh, that we don't want to take the free trip away for or the inexpensive trip away from anybody in the county. But what happens if we? For some reason, you don't get the matching funds. I don't want to see us coming back to the general corporate fund and asking them to pick up the difference. That's and I need some kind of, we need some kind of assurance that that's not going to happen. Well, we'll do our best, and that's why. If that's you, not good enough. I want assurance, if not you, our best. If you look at the intergovernmental agreement, we put a clause in there that specifies that our PC staff will be working with CUMTD to find those local contracts. And that's the way that Chris today has five different local contracts. Then with that funding that we'll be collecting, we are hoping to match the funding that we receive, what is needed. There is also in there a uh, line that says that within 90 days, if we don't have the local match, we'll discuss it with the Rural Transit Advisory Group. That's why we have the Rural Transit 
advisory group and define the best way of moving forward. We can reduce the service, we can eliminate the service, and ensure that that's not going to happen, but perhaps there will be a need to reduce the service. So far, that hasn't occurred yet, and it's the same situation that Chris has been uh, providing the service in the last three years. It's the same situation. I guess I would have felt better if it was said that in here, that absolutely if the funding wasn't available, that we, we, we would reduce the service to match the funds that you had available. And that's what practically so, says in there, in the agreement. In okay. it, it is in the agreement. You, did, you didn't say that earlier. You wouldn't give me a chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Jim. I actually did say that, but that's okay. Um, I guess everybody's talking about the policy. What, what Chris does is go to all the communities in Champaign County. I mean, <coughs> I, I'd like to say like four of them and see if that's true. Muhammad, Tolono, St. Joe, and Rantoul specifically, and it's giving low or reduced rate transportation to areas of the county that really don't have access to transportation. I'm mm -hmm. repeating something a lot of people in this room know, but there are people watching that may need access to transportation for doctors or or mm -hmm. groceries or something that can no longer drive, and that's what it's about, right? Okay. Yes. So I just want to confirm that. And there's probably other areas that an MTD may be able to ha um, give us access to or give those folks access, like, access to. All right, okay. Um, the other part is um, it, it, we're not working with Chris any longer, so uh, is there transportation still to Danville? Is there a yes. connection between the two? Okay. Yes, it's not related to this. Okay. Uh, and finally, we're, we're calling it Crest, but it, obviously that's something that's happened in Vermillion County. What are we going to be called now? Um, the name that we'll have now is C-Carts. That means Champaign County Area Rural uh, Transportation System. Okay. Thank you. Jay. Josh? Uh, do we have a motion on the floor? Um, Rita, is A through I, those are all related, correct, on our? Yes. I would make an omnibus motion to approve A through I. Second. What's that? Can we? Yes. We'll need a roll call on that. Yes, we need, uh, you second? Well, sure. I haven't had discussion yet. We just have a motion on the floor for omnibus. I need a second. Second by Stan. Discussion, Diane. If I can go back to the funding on page 91 just really quick so I can get this in my brain here. Mm -hmm. um, the 741 approximately 662, that leaves about 109 here is what I calculate. Is that something that you um, have the ability to use for like extra gas or if you would buy a new vehicle or something? When you don't use the funds, mm -hmm. you cannot carry them over. Mm -hmm. There almost needs to be a bit of a backup plan or some kind of contingency to make sure those pl those funds are used if the $100,000 left mm -hmm. or do you, I mean I just don't want to see it going back if we need a new bus or if the insurance goes up or something like that the new buses we usually put grant applications to get the buses and we don't pay for that we go, right. we get them through grants and actually we just received three vehicles last week right. um, the problem is that we need to match that funding so then you can if we, use that to match? No. We have to match that funding. We need to get okay. more local match to oh, be okay. able to pull down that funding. I've got it now. Thanks. Thank you. Just a quick comment to Chief Jay. I, I happen to agree with you, but looking around this room, I don't see 15 votes for a budget amendment to <laughs> contribute to money anyway, so I think you're safe. All right. Any other discussion on this issue? All right, roll call, please. That's just an omnibus motion, A through I. Roll call, please. Harkey? Yes. James? Yes. Jay? Reluctantly, yes. Kibler? <laughs> yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Richards? Schwartz? Yes. Alex? Yes. Bergson? Yes. Carter? Yes. Cowart? Yes. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Kurtz? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you.
Uh, let's move on to what? Uh, I got it. You you have it, don't you? Well, okay. All right, I'll read it. Okay, uh, Jeff. <laughs> All right, uh, adoption of resolution. This is an emergency proce uh, procurement for Conley Highway, resolution number 8935. Can I have a motion to approve, please? Uh, John and uh, Lloyd, second. Uh, Jeff, give us a quick. Uh, this point was of right, order. This was very quick to happen here. We just got this. Point of, sorry, point of order. There's actually no motion that's been stated. There's just a discussion of a of an emergency resolution, but we don't know what the emergency is, so well, I would recommend we don't have a... You have the resolution. You have the, res the resolutions here in front oh, of you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Jeff. Oh, so, excuse me. There it just is. Providing it's hiding this right in front section. of you. Pink, the pink one. Ah. Okay. And that's what the motion's on. Can we put it on mine? Okay. All right. Uh, in the corner. Hat, dunce hat, you know, oh, never mind. Okay. Uh, Jeff? What's up? Okay, so um, I put on your desk also a uh, sheet of paper on the front. It says CMS in big letters, and on the back there's a, a copy of an email that I received from the uh, deputy director of CMS. Um, this is a letter that we received um, late last week, early this week. Basically, um, every year uh, CMS does a joint bid for all the local entities in the state of Illinois for um, uh, bulk rock salt uh, for snow and ice control during the winter. Um, we put in this year for uh, roughly 5,000 tons of, of rock salt into the CMS bid. There were 500 and some agencies from across the state that all did the same thing. Um, CMS received bids from uh, rock salt vendors and 195 of the local communities did not receive a bid for their particular rock salt that they asked to get bids on. Um, and Champaign County is unfortunately uh, one of those entities that did not receive a bid for our bulk rock salt. Um, <clears throat> as you can see there in the middle of the, uh, the first paragraph, it says, that additionally, the prices received for the locations that did receive offers ranged from seventy to over one hundred and forty dollars per ton. Last year, um, I would note that our rock salt from CMS was uh, fifty-four dollars and seventy-one cents, or something like that. So you can see the uh, the increase there, just between seventy and one hundred and forty, from our fifty-four dollar rock salt last year. Um, they're blaming this on a number of things. It's very, very difficult to get an answer out of anybody in Springfield as to why this actually happened. Um, I can't imagine why that is, but um, basically what they're telling us is we can rebid our rock salt through CMS. They're going to go out for a rebid. Um, if we tell them we want 5,000 tons of rock salt and they get a bid of $200 per ton, we have to buy a million dollars worth of rock salt. We don't have any way to reject the bids. We have no way to get out of the bids, which is crazy. I've never heard of anything where you have to accept 100% of the quantity at whatever price the vendor bids. Sounds like a great deal for the vendors to me. Um, so obviously I'm very reluctant to go that route. Um, now, what other routes do we have? We could uh, go out and solicit our own bids for rock salts uh, and go through basically the same process that CMS is going to go through, which means uh, we have to get together um, proposals. They have to be approved by IDOT. They have to come back to us. We have to advertise for two weeks. We have to take bids, open bids, and then award the bids to the lowest responsible bidder. Um, Unfortunately, we would be doing that at the same time as CMS is trying to do bids for rock salt as well. And there's no guarantee we'll even get a bid. As a matter of fact, CMS told us that it's likely prices on salt on the rebid will be in the $200 a ton range. And it's likely that a number of the communities will not receive a bid the second time around because literally these salt companies have got a stranglehold on the salt industry and there's, there is a shortage of it because of uh, the harsh winter that we had last year. So um, 
it leaves us in quite a predicament. I don't know if you've looked in our salt dome, but what little salt is in there is not ours. It's the city of Urbana's. We have absolutely no salt at all to uh, put down on the roads this winter. Um, and Champaign County, as well as 195 other entities, are trying to find places to, to dig up rock salt. Um, so uh, what you have in front of you is a, is a resolution asking that uh, we bypass the uh, bidding process and go through an emergency procurement to take quotes in order to try to get um, some security on some rock salt prices so that we know that we'll have some salt for the 2014-2015 um, snow and, and ice season. Um, right now, the only, I've got two bids in the 108 to 109 dollar range. It's not 200 dollars. It's obviously not 54 dollars. It's somewhere in between. Um, so I'm here before you to um, tell you what I'm telling you that um, this was unforeseen by everybody in the state. I'm I'm still curious as to why this happened with CMS, but um, there's no getting to the bottom of it. Um, but we basically have four options that I can, I can see. We can go back to CMS and ask for them to rebid it where we have to guarantee 100% of, uh, of the quantity that we ask for and we have to pay whatever bid price they receive from the vendors. Um, we can rebid this through our own process, which will take you know, likely three to four weeks to, uh, to get bids back and be kind of in tandem with the CMS, which probably puts us in a pretty bad bidding climate because they're going to be going out if, let's say, 60 to 70 of the entities go back to CMS and say we want to rebid, <clears throat> they're going to be looking for a huge quantity of rock salt and we're going to be looking for a small quantity, um, which I think puts us in a predicament there. Um, we can minimize. This is what Vermilion County is doing. According to their county engineer, they usually buy 2,500 tons of rock salt per year. They're going to buy 250 this year, and they're not going to salt like they typically do. And they're just going to tell everybody, "You got to slow down. You got to take caution because <clears throat> we don't have the salt to put down this year." That's an option. And the fourth option is the one that's in the resolution before you: is to uh, take quotes. We're not going to be able to buy. We bid for around 5,000 because we wanted to replenish our supply in the salt dump so that we had um, some on hand. In a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a typical winter, which last year was not, um, we're at about 3,000 to 3,500 tons is what we need to keep the roads the way they've traditionally been, which means we're plowing 24-7, we're de-icing, um, all 200 miles of our roads, and we're trying to get bare pavement all the time. Um, so if we go below that, we're going to have to reduce the, you know, the expectation of the driver. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, if we had 5,000 tons at 50 bucks a ton, that's about $250,000. That's roughly what we had budgeted. At 100 and some dollars a ton, that only gets us 2,000 to 2,500 tons, which you know, is less than what we would typically need. So um, <clears throat> I'm here to see what, uh, what avenue the county board sees as a policy decision we should go for this predicament that we're in, basically. Chris? So let me make sure I understand the situation. If you do go out and get quotes from suppliers, we can then decide whether we want to buy or not. We decide how much we want to buy from one or more suppliers at whatever at the price we're able to negotiate. Right. And we may end up buying less in order to, if the prices are too high, we buy less. If the prices are low, we buy more, right? Right. Okay. Given the spectacular value that CMS has offered us in this process, <laughs> I see absolutely no problem with that. Uh, first an information question and then a statement of faith in you. Uh, I've never bought anything more than table salt. So <laughs> I, um, I, <coughs> I respect the strategies you've laid out for us, uh, but can one not so much just the money alone, but if one buys a small amount or half the amount that you project is needed, 
what uh, happens to the price midwinter to go back and get the rest of it? If there are supplies available, they would be substantially higher. Higher, okay. And then uh, I have so much faith in your skills to do a good job of bidding that maybe what we should consider is have you freelance bidding from now on out on buying <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and save the <laughs> county money. Uh, yep. Hi, Mr. Blue. Quick question for you. So this resolution would give you authority to place bids and accept bids at, at your discretion, correct? So you would not be coming back to the county board saying, I received a $98 price. Uh, this is what I'd like to do with it, except E or nay. We're accepting it today. You're accepting it today, but at, at some point, I'm going to have to bring back, back a resolution to... Um, to, to use motor fuel tax monies to buy this salt. So at that point, you know, it's gonna, there's going to be a resolution that says we're appropriating X number of dollars for X number of tons of rock salt through the county motor fuel tax fund. Um, unfortunately, as much as I have scrambled, and I actually got an email while I was sitting here waiting for this to <clears throat> come up, um, I'm still getting quotes on salt. Um, I've got about four right now. I've got another guy that says he's on vacation. He'll get me one Monday. I don't know how long I can wait before it catches up with me. That's what worries me. Um, you have to have these documents back to CMS on Friday, and then they're going to go out for bids probably next week. So <clears throat> we need to, I think, if we're going to go with the quoting process, we need to get something locked in probably tomorrow. So in other words, you're going to... You've, you've, you've received these bids, you will probably end up accepting the bids, but there will be another gating factor that says, will we actually appropriate the money? Yeah, we're going to have to, we're going to have to appropriate the motor fuel tax money to actually pay for the salt. Okay. Yes. Okay. So in, in Mr. Alex's idea, or his initial um, mention, I, I would tell CMS to go away. Quite frankly, I think that's kind of a ridiculous notion. Uh, and then secondly, I, I like the Vermilion plan. If you're looking for any guidance from, from my perspective, if it, it's better to um, tell the public what exactly is our predicament and, and inform them and try to inform them as early as possible and save if we can do it. This is one of those things where we can probably cut back on as long as we're proactive. So if you're looking for any guidance from the board. Yeah, and I don't, honestly, with the budget that we have, there's no doubt we have to cut back. It's just a matter of how much. Um, you know, it, at $108 a ton, which is the current best quote I have, you know, it's 2000 to 2500 somewhere in between there is all we can get. And we're usually 30, you know, th but... I can't sit here and predict what Mother Nature is going to do to us either. You know, we've had a couple winters where we didn't need much salt, and we had last winter where we needed every drop we could possibly get. So um, it's a guessing game, unfortunately. Uh, Jim, Gary, and then Chris on the second round. Oh, Lloyd also. All right, Jim. So in other words, you're asking to be able to spend $250,000 before CMS gets in the market and raises That's the That's correct. Right. Yes, sir. Gary. Uh, I think Jeff's on the right track here, uh, in my opinion. Uh, essentially, what he's asking for is a, to bypass the state uh, motor fuel tax requirements on bidding and still be able to use motor fuel tax to yes. buy the stuff. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to try to nail down a quote as soon as possible. I think he's probably going to have to cut back. And again, like Jeff uh, just said, it, it, we need to keep the public informed. And I think the public will go along uh, uh, with, uh, with adequate uh, education on our part. Uh, there are some ways you can extend your salt uh, by blending with, the sand, with some sand and that sort of thing. You can get by with that out in the rural areas. It doesn't work very well in town. Yeah. But uh, those are the things you can do. I think you can scrape by. And there's very good, very good possibility we have a mild winter. Salt could get cheaper during the winter. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've discussed blending, as Gary mentioned, um, and people do it with cinders, they do it with sand, whatever grit you can get. Um, 
the situation we're in is we're sharing the salt dome with the city of Urbana. They don't want that stuff on the city streets going into the storm sewers. So unless we had our own separate facility in which to blend material, we really don't have that option at this point to be able to do that. Lloyd? Jeff, do you have time for a conversation in the morning? Absolutely. Always for you, sir. Always. <laughs> Ask your microphone, please. You know, if we don't use the salt, then we're going to have more accidents, especially with young kids. And those cost a lot more than salt. And I really hate to cut back on the salt and have the accidents. Absolutely. Um, Stan's next. Since you're sharing that dome with Urbana, are you going to ask them to see if they want to go in with your pricing? They actually got a bid, if you can believe that. We did not to put salt in our own dome, but they got a bid to put salt in our dome. Wow. <laughs> so raise the bid, you rental know? price uh, on the dome. <laughs> what, what was that bid, Jeff? Huh? What was that bid? You know? It was 12. They got 1,200 tons. And you know how much they paid? They won't. They don't give you that information from CMS. The only reason I got that is from Bill Gray. So um, CMS won't tell you who got it, who didn't, and what they're paying. They, they give you this $70 to $140 a ton stuff. They won't tell you. That's nice. It's Maybe crazy. We should just blockade our uh, dome, and they can put it in their uh, back. I don't believe I'll. I don't believe we'll continue to use CMS as our bidding source anymore. We're going to do it on our own if. Got it. Okay. Uh, if we can. <laughs> I voted for that. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> yes. Uh, John, early April. -ish. We saw in the first round, John. Uh, Jeff, uh, did the townships bid with you with this, or were they bidding with this, the CMI, CMIS? Us. Savoy did not get a bid. Champaign Township did not get a bid. Muhammad Township did not get a bid. Urbana Township did not get a bid. And any of the outlying townships that just get a few tons just come and get it from us and they buy it from us. So the only people that I know of in this area that got a bid was the city of Urbana. As a matter of fact, this is hard to believe, but the Storage facilities in Champaign County owned by IDOT do not have salt bids to put salt in them. Even IDOT didn't get bids. Chris? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, if you, you were talking about the time frame being as short as tomorrow. If we get a quote, there's some validity period on the quote, right? I mean, if somebody quotes us 60 bucks or 80 bucks or 100 bucks, presumably that's a... 10-day quote or 30-day quote or something, right? Right. I mean, we don't have to make the decision to buy on the spot. You just have to get the quote, right? The quote I that I have in front of me expires in the morning for $108 a ton. And It was a three-day quote. So that's actually that, the time frame is that the spot price changes that quickly. I, I'm not a farmer, but you guys that are know how yeah, grain right. and stuff okay. goes, and they're <laughs> buying this stuff on the futures. It's absolutely yeah. – one guy sent me an email and said, I got – what, it was kind of like old corn and new corn, right? He said, I got, I got old salt sitting in, in Chicago at 79 bucks a ton FOB. I got to figure out what it's going to cost me to get it to you. I said, okay, well, tell me what it's going to cost you to get it to me. You know, we were even talking about if we could, uh, we could get some just barged into Peoria, we'll take our own trucks over and get it, but we can't get anybody to do that for us. I mean, we've been scratching and scraping and trying to find every avenue. Um, CMS gave us a list of 40 different vendors, and we've called every single one or emailed them if we couldn't get to them through a phone. It's been a wild week. All right. Thank you for, for educating me on the salt market. I guess my, my final comment is I, I think Ms. Berkson has a good point. I mean, and to one extent, yeah, we salt the roads to make it safer for people who are out there trying to get to work and trying to go about their daily lives. But on the other hand, you know, we got squad cars and ambulances and fire trucks out there too who have to be there right. and don't have a choice to call in, you know, and take a snow day. So uh, I think we've definitely, you know, clearly we're not going to be able to do the great job we did this last year, but uh, I think we definitely can't, uh, you know, completely turn our backs on this uh, on this problem. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move to a vote on this uh, resolution. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Jeff, get us a quick bid, would you? Yeah, thank you. You got it. Um, 
Who's going to do policy? <laughs> Jeff, you're going to do policy? James, James is not here. Okay. Uh, policy moves uh, for adoption of the Children's Advocacy Center request for job cont content evaluation committee review and recommendation for forensic interviewer. Uh, second, please. Second by Aaron. Uh, any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Jeff. Policy moves for adoption of resolution number 8926, approving the appointment of election judges for the 2014 through 2016 term. Have a second, please. Second. Second by Gary. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Finally, I move for adoption of resolution 8927 to establish place of election for the city of Champaign, number 31. Can I have a second, please? Second. I'm sorry. Second, second by Josh. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Chris, finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of resolution number 8928, payment of claims authorization. I have a second, please. Second. Second by Jeff. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I move adoption of resolution 8929, purchases not following the purchasing policy. Uh, second by Astrid. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I move adoption of resolution number 8930, authorizing the budget amendment 14-27, uh, pass through of $47,584 in increased appropriations and revenue uh, for the Regional Planning Commission for the uh, Governing Planning and Economic Development Grant. I'll need a second first. Jeff, all right. This is a 15-vote approval with a roll call vote on C and D. Uh, can I have uh, any discussion on this prior to the vote? All right, roll call, please. Harkey? Yes. James? Yes. Jay? Yes. Kibler? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Richards? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Alex? Yes. Berkson? Carter? Yes. Cohort? Yes. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Harkey? Or I'm sorry, Kurtz? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of resolution number 8931, authorizing budget transfer 14 6, uh, state's attorney support enforcement budget, moving $6,700 from the regular full time employees line to the equipment less than $5,000 line. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on this? Uh, I need second, John. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Also need 15 votes. Roll call, please. Harkey? Yes. James? Yes. Jay? Yes. Kibler? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Richards? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Alex? Berkson? Yes. Carter? Yes. Cohort? Yes. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Kurtz? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Chris. Chris, uh, Labor Committee. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, Mr. Chair, I move adoption of resolution number 8932, approving the agreement between the Champaign County Board, the Sheriff of Champaign County, and the Illinois Fraternal Order of Police Labor Council, Champaign County Office of the Sheriff's Corrections Sergeants Division, December 1, 2013 to December 31, 2016. Second, please. Second by Jeff. Stan. I mean, I agree with the, the contract. The only thing that I did like, and I did talk to the Sheriff's Office, and I
ramp tool. We opened that door a long time ago, and most of our officers, uh, we've lost that personal contact, and we also have seen a change in our communities that we don't think, uh, some of us don't think, I shouldn't say everybody, that the officers are in tune to our community and keep our watch on them like they used to when they lived there. I would just like to provide a little bit of clarification, and I understand your statement. The issue here is, though, that this language is already in the corrections contract where we employ about 60 correctional officers. And typically, the person coming into the corrections sergeant's position is coming from the corrections contract. And so, so if that person happens to live over the Piatt County line and is the right person to be promoted to sergeant, you know, they didn't want to be in a position where they would have to force that individual to move in order to take the promotion. So that's why it was included in this contract. Wait a minute. All right. Stan, you want to finish? And Deb, I understand that, but I think Rantoul had a requirement that if you were promoted to a department head or something like that, you had six months upon that promotion to, to move into your community because your your services are valued and, and you're needed to be where they need you. And I, I understand what you're saying, but it's a tough call when we start doing it. Diane? Are these people that take um, county vehicles home? All right, because that would probably be where I would feel very um, and, and embarrassed the require, the with our vehicles in, law in a different county. Law enforcement has a requirement that you reside in Champaign yes. County. Yes, that's why I was just trying to make sure I got my mind straight. Thank you. All right, is there any further discussion on this resolution, on the contract? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move adoption of resolution number 8933, approving agreement between the Champaign County Board and AFSCME Council 31 for the nursing home general unit covering December 1st, 2013 to December 31st, 2016. Second by Gary. Discussion, Jeff. I will be abstaining from the vote because my immediate family is in direct competition with the nursing home. Thank you. One abstention. Uh, any other discussion on this issue? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Chris, please. And finally, Mr. Chair, I move adoption of resolution number 8934, approving agreement between the Champaign County Board and AFSCME Council 31 for the nursing home nurses unit covering December 1st, 2013 through December 1st, this, excuse me, December 31st, 2016. Second, please, by Stan <coughs> Harper. Stan Harper. Um, any discussion? Jeff, again? Yeah. Same, same abstention. Same abstention. All right. Uh, Chris. I just wanted to say with regard to the to the previous two, I uh, wanted to express my thanks on behalf of the Labor Committee for the efforts that uh, that MPA and uh, Champaign County and uh, nursing home staff uh, and uh, our uh, labor attorney put into negotiating this. These were, uh, I think, effective, cordial, and, uh, and positive negotiations for both sides, and they have not always been. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, and also with regard to the first uh, contract with the uh, uh, correction sergeant, so I would pass the same uh, thanks along to the uh, sheriff's office. Thank you. Uh, I really uh, reiterate that uh, those comments. It was a long but very cordial uh, negotiations. Uh, is there any further discussion on this last resolution? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, is there any other business? Is there any new business? I don't think do we have anything else. Uh, call for adjournment, please. Motion. Motion by Stan, second by Jeff. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>